go into the presentation. I'm just going to run through quickly what this is about, who I am, and what this whole initiative is about. And the idea is just to give you know, some details in terms of what we've been doing this year as Friends of a Cebu Pan-African Village, and also where we're headed for 2024. I work very closely with Byron, who's on the ground there in, in a Cebu. And I'm based in the UK, but I always go across to a Cebu. I'm going across next month. So I'm really looking forward to that. And I was there last month as well. So, or was it the month before October? So I'm quite working quite closely on the ground with what's happening there. We're also expecting if he's able to join Mikhail, because uh, he is the president of the Plot Holders Association. So he always keeps in touch. I keep in touch with him. I think it's really good that we put our hands together and work as one so that we can ensure that the Pan-African Village Initiative, which was probably started by others, can be successful. There was the people who sort of, you know, kicked the ball to the goalpost, and then some of us have now come forward, and we want to kick the ball into the goalpost to make sure that the initiative succeeds. So there's various groups doing things on the ground, and I, for one, think it's really important that we work together with these people. So my name is Rachel O'Kello. I'm in the UK. I'm a UK-based solicitor. Been a solicitor now since 2002. So literally, as of last month, it was 21, 20, what's that make me? I don't know, 21 years as solicitor um, in the UK. So I'm very much looking forward now to my retirement, and I want that to be on the motherland. So I'm Welsh-born, which Wales is a part of the United Kingdom. So it's not England, it's Wales. So I was born in Wales to Grenadian parents. Grenada is in the Caribbean. And my husband is Ugandan, so I also do a lot of things with Uganda as well. And recently getting into doing things with Togo and working with the Ministry of Tourism in Togo as well. So my first trip to Sub-Saharan Africa, I went to Egypt before, but in terms of what we call Black Africa, was in 1995. And I've been doing things in Africa and going to Africa since then. And I've been investing in Africa since 2004. So we do trips to the continent to Ghana we did our first trip to Ghana in October it was really successful and by all means later if anybody who went on the trip wishes to say anything then you're more than welcome we do trips to Uganda Uganda we go to the northern part of Uganda so we brought people there on customized trips and we're going to be expanding those tours to have people come in groups who want to visit the northern region of Uganda so northern Uganda is very much a agricultural area is very vast, huge, goes right up to South Sudan, up to across to the Congo and to Kenya. And you can even go through to Tanzania from there as well. Also, I'm doing stuff with the UK delegate for Togo and the Togolese ministry to try and feed a little bit of what Ghana has been doing to welcome the diaspora. Togo is another place where the lots of people were taken through the transatlantic slave trade, walked from Togo to Ghana, and then even on the Togolese coast as well, because they also have a, a large coast in terms of their land area. And so a lot of people were taken from there as well. So we are looking as well to do our first trip to Togo, and that should be in October of this year, because this year is the year of Pan-Africanism, 2024, and Togo are going to be the hosts. So Togo is right next to Ghana. and. I'm going to go there next month as well to see exactly what's happening on the ground there. And I'm going to be happy to report to you what's going on. So we did our trip to the Pan-African village. And you can see here Chief Okatechi Amamfi the seventh. He is in the green in the middle. He welcomed us as friends of a Sabre Pan-African village. And it's really nice to see some of the people there on the, on the, in the meeting today. It was really an excellent tour. Excellent for me because it was my first tour, but I was in good hands, even in terms of the guests that we had brought. So I think, you know, we were all teaching each other and learning from each other to make the trip a really memorable trip. And I think everyone enjoyed themselves. And it was really good for me as well, going to Ghana for the first time with a trip of people who were really accommodating and wonderful to take. So this was a meeting that we had arranged by Byron Crosdale with the Paramount Chief. And those are people from the tour and some friends on the ground in Ghana as well, who are from the diaspora. 
So we had a really good time. And what we're doing is very important to realise that what we're doing has been endorsed by the Paramount Chief because there's lots of things happening on the ground in a Cebu. Lots of people are doing different things, and that's great. But I think one of the things I'm trying to ensure is that what we do has the blessing of the chief, that he's up to date of what we're doing, and he knows the plans that we've got. So we're working very closely side by side with him. So during the tour, we went to the Pan-African village, and we're going to talk today about how you can exactly acquire land in the Pan-African village, because it's really important. As I say, there's a lot going on on the ground, and it's really important that people understand the process. So that's something that Byron and I are going to go through today so that everyone doesn't pay more than they need to be paying and gets the land on the Pan-African village and not somewhere elsewhere close by that they didn't realise they were not quite on the Pan-African village and becomes a real part of the Pan-African village community. And the importance of that is because the paramount chief is the one who is in control of the Pan-African village. And he is doing that in, in collaboration, if you like, with the Ghanaian uh, government. And so that gives us that level of protection as people from the diaspora who are not from Ghana that we wouldn't normally have if we went and bought land or uh, acquired land elsewhere. So from the point of view that, you know, if people want to be on the Pan-African village, then we're going to show you the process and the steps that you need to do to ensure that the land you've got on the Pan-African village is actually on the Pan-African village and you haven't paid any more for it. So these are just a few pictures from the trip because... A Cebu, Pan-African village, is very near Cape Coast. It's in the Cape Coast area, actually. So Cape Coast itself is about 25 minutes or so away. And this is Cape Coast Castle, or I should be calling it Cape Coast Dungeons. That's us in the dungeon. So you can either say Cape Coast Castle, which is what the Europeans will say when they tour Ghana. They'll say that they're going to see historic European architecture in the old Gold Coast. But we, coming from the diaspora, knowing that it's some a pilgrimage for us to pay homage to our ancestors and to respect our heritage. We will call it Cape Coast Dungeons. And so this is us underneath the castle. We are actually in the dungeons, which is where the enslaved Africans were kept. Then we went across to Asin Mansu, which is the last bath. And that is said to be the place where our enslaved ancestors took their last bath before being walked all the way back to Cape Coast Castle, Cape Coast Dungeons, because that's where they ended up, which is about driving about an hour, hour and a half away. So walking is a long, is a long walk, but certainly they walked, they weren't driven. So that is the last bath. And we went to see that as well. So fortunately, our tour in March, we give thanks, is full. And so people in March will be seeing similar sites as well. And this is Elena, who was our wonderful host, I should say, or my co-host. She is from the Cape Coast area, and we just had somebody local with local knowledge there. And as you can see, I wanted to take a picture of the beach, because a lot of Ghana, people don't realise, is beach life. And so a lot of what we do, although we don't go and see the heritage sites during the day, and we had a lot of business meetings, we also had a lot of time to relax and repose on the beach as well. So there's plenty of beach life in Ghana. So for those who don't know, Ghana is a country in West Africa. It shares a border with Togo, the Ivory Coast, and Burkina Faso is in the north. Historically, Ghana was the first country to get independence under the prime minister, president, I should say, Kwame Krumah in 1957. And so Ghana has a terrible history of slavery, having participated in their own words in the enslavement uh, trade of Africans, of their fellow Africans, and now what they are doing, they are calling us home and they've called us home in what is called the year of the return. And so in 2019, many, many people went to Ghana from across the diaspora to rediscover their roots and their heritage. And that was a specific call from the president to uh, encourage us, the diaspora, to go to Ghana. And that is at the same time that the king, paramount chief, um, Okatechi, apologized to us for the role of his predecessors in the slave trade, and welcomed us to the Pan-African village to live there. And so at the moment, Ghana is in the phase of beyond the return, which is 2020 to 2030. And so really, it's all hands on deck as we try to re-establish ourselves back in the continent, using Ghana as a gateway to the rest of Africa. And so 
The Pan African village was spearheaded by Chief Ukatechi and the elders of the Asebu region, and they offered land to the brothers and sisters from the diaspora for us to settle there and to relocate. So it's not really a place where it's for business purposes in the sense of residential. It's somewhere where we're supposed to live. And there are a few people, Byron included in that, who have actually built their houses on the Pan-African village. There are people who are on in this meeting who own land in the Pan-African village. They have got their plots of land in the Pan-African village and will probably be making steps to develop their land and to build their homes on there. So it's really probably a holiday home or a home where you live full time. And our aim as Friends of a Sabre Pan-African Village is to promote the concept of relocation to Africa generally, to promote the Sabre traditional area, and to promote the free land offer in the Sabre Pan-African Village. So in terms of people acquiring land in Ghana, it's a minefield in and of itself. I wouldn't dare to talk to people about how to acquire land in the rest of Ghana, but having gone to the Sabre Pan-African village, spoken to people on the ground and had several meetings with the Paramount Chief, I have decided that promoting the free land offer in the Sabre Pan-African village is something I'd like to get involved in. And we say free land, but the criteria for the land is that there are administration costs or whatever costs you want to label them as, but they are compulsory costs of 1200 US dollars. Um, to acquire the land. And so I'm going to go through the steps in the moment. So Seibu, for people who don't know, is two and a half hours from Accra. And uh, it's on the way to Cape Coast. So you can see the picture there. Seibu is just at the top, in the middle, in the middle of the picture, just above Yamaransa. And then you turn off if you're on your way to Cape Coast. So it's in a very good location. I mean, we didn't stay in Seibu when we went there because the facilities are not there yet in terms of accommodation, although there are some basic, basic accommodation there. But we stayed near Cape Coast, and then most of the time in the evenings, we were able to go down to Cape Coast and spend the evenings in the, on the beach in Cape Coast. So it's very, very near to Cape Coast, so it's a good location. And this is the new site plan, which looks very similar to the old one, but the few changes which have been made, and you can see the red boxes the small red boxes those are where people then you know those are where the plots of land is where you have your plot allocated and the others are the yellow is education the green spaces are public open spaces the blue is commercial so people who want to do some commercial activity there's a place for that to happen gray which i can't see gray here is, well i can see one gray build which is a public utility and they've got also space for civic and culture as well. So at the moment, it's just residential that we see when we go to the Pan-African village. But this is the plan that the uh, Paramount Chief has in terms of the future of the Pan-African village. And so it's called a Seibu Pan-African village. So if you get in land anywhere else, which is not called a Seibu Pan-African village, it can be in a Seibu, it can be in all different places. But unless it's a Seibu Pan-African village, you're not getting the land offer that we're talking about to be getting land elsewhere and this land offer has leasehold land for 50 years so as most of us are not Ghanaian then the land will be leasehold for 50 years come next year we'll be having a meeting with the land commission we had a very interesting meeting with the land commission recently as part of our tour and I want to bring him back so that we can open it up so that everybody can understand the land acquisition process in Ghana from the horse's mouth, as it were. So the plot size is 80 by 100 feet. So it's quite a large size plot. And so just to run through quickly the steps, and then I'll pass to Byron just to give any comment. Step one is visit Ghana and the Sable Pan African village. So I would really highly recommend, I get people who contact me all the time. Oh, Rachel, I want 10 plots, literally 10 plots. And I'm thinking, well, you haven't even been there yet, you know. So it's a good idea, I think, to go to Ghana to ensure that you like Ghana firstly, because that's where the Pan African village is. It's not just on YouTube, it is actually a place. And then to go and visit Ghana and then visit the Pan African village, because you may then again love Ghana, but you don't want to be in the Pan African village for different reasons. And you may want to be somewhere else in Ghana, or you may decide you don't like Ghana altogether and you want to stay in Babylon after all. But, you know, it's always good to, to go and have a look. You then make the payment. So I get people asking me they want to get a land agent. They want to do this. They want to do that. 
and that's what it is. If you want to get your plot of land in a Pan-African village, you make the payment of 1,200 US dollars because there's no land agent. It, it literally is a payment into the bank account of the Paramount chief. Now, what I say to people is make the payment into the bank account of the Paramount chief as on his website, which is a sableman.com. So ours is a sablepav.com. And you can link there into the chief's website, which is a sableman.com. And his bank details are on there. And I highly recommend that you make the payment into the chief's account. Because if you pay into somebody else's account, it may not be going to the chief for a start. And you may be paying more than the $1,200, which you don't need to pay. This, you know, We do other things around helping people, but we don't get involved in charging for the land itself because there's no need. You're going to make the payment of 1200 and then they're going to allocate you the land. Next thing you need to do to ensure that you've made the payment into the correct place is get an official receipt from the office. So you'll get an official receipt from the office, which is Florence in the office. She is part of the administrative team, as is Byron, and she will give you a receipt from the office, which will in, uh, indicate that you pay the 1200 into the account of the Paramount Chief. The next thing after you've got your receipt, and that receipt can even be sent to you by WhatsApp. Don't email because nobody will answer. We answer our emails, but unfortunately, the Pan-African village don't answer their emails, but we answer ours. Then you'll get your yellow allocation paper to show that you've been allocated and which plot you've been allocated. And it will be in your name or joint names, and you'll have that yellow allocation paper. And then a few months later, so the allocation, the receipt can be given straight away, the allocation paper probably in a week or two, and then the indenture, which is the agreement, will have the site plan and that will take about three months to come through. And that is all arranged by the office. So they may be slow-ish, but nobody else is going to get it necessarily any quicker from the office because it's the office that are going to process everybody's paperwork and even if somebody got it quicker one way or another it wouldn't matter because once you've been given that yellow allocation paper that shows the land has been allocated to you and you're free to do different things that you want to do on the land anyway so you're just waiting for the indenture there's no rush there's no rush to buy the land there's over how much thousands of acres so you shouldn't let anybody say oh you've got to buy the land quick 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 there's no rush whatsoever and there's no rush to get the indenture either because they will give you that indenture. So you don't need to pay anybody extra to do that. And then once you've got the allocation paper, you can then get the land cleared and fenced off so that your boundary is known. So some people build a whole wall, like I wouldn't build a wall and I've not built a wall and I would just build a, a fence. Like where I've built already in Uganda, we've just put like a wooden fence with wires and the land that we've got in Ghana, that's what we're going to do. But we're not in a big rush anyway, because the Pan-African village, there's not many houses on there. So whereas your no one's infringed on the land in all these years that the, the land has been there, they're not just suddenly going to infringe on the land because you've been allocated a plot. So I would err really against spending your money on building a wall. Probably you'd spend the money using the bricks to build a house because really the boundary is not a huge issue at the moment. And also you need to get a building permit as well before you obviously start building. Once you've got your land, then you can get your building permit as well. So that was step seven. I don't know why I put six twice. So Byron, I wanted to pass across to you just to, if you can, just give a, an indication of how people would start with the building process and what, what services you can offer to people in that regard. And then we'll open for a Q&A. Okay, Rachel. Yeah. Yeah, I, I see you do all your homework. You've covered everything and you've done, you done good. So what did you want me to explain? So I've just gone up to step seven, which is getting the building permit. And then just to give people an idea of what they'll do next in terms of building. Or if you just happen to take some questions, then we can just go straight into the questions. Yeah, the permit is, is very important because when once you get your land allocation paper, you could start building. 
but then you know you have to have your drawing exactly the same as what you built so you can get your permit the same you know uh, and in some instance people get their permit first but you can but you can build without your permit and this site you know because uh, the paramount chief went to the um the, like say the town hall and talk to the people there and um and we can actually start building and and this site you know because it class as a private site so yeah so that is is that one okay so if if anyone wants to i know you cover a lot of things but if anyone wants to know anything that you haven't covered or if they got a question yeah they can just uh, go on go ahead and, and fire on yes what, so, what is the process but, of uh, getting the permit sorry what is the process of getting the permit how do you apply for it okay so you have to wait until you have your paperwork and and then you have to get your your drawing you know architectural drawing done for how you want your house to be and then you have to take that and your paperwork in and and get it passed and get your permit but all that cost there's a cost for that i believe it might have been about two and a half thousand Ghana CDs, but I'm not sure. So that's it. Okay, thanks. Okay. Hi, this yeah. is so we, we can find out the cost for people when they need it as well. Who is next? Mm -hmm. Hi, Rachel, it's Tammy. Hi, Tammy. Tammy, then I can see Carl is there. So Tammy, yeah, thank you. Thanks. Um, thanks for the information. I'm actually here on behalf of my client who wants to purchase the land in a Cebu. How do we go about determining which plots are available and which ones might be better than others? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So that's why the first thing I guess I said was mm -hmm. to go and visit, visit the Pan-African village. Because otherwise, what happens, because the whole ethos of this is that the land is free. Mm -hmm. So although you make a payment for the land, it's considered to be free land. It makes sense to some of us that it's free, even though you have to make a, a compulsory payment because you're not paying for the actual land, you're paying for the services. It doesn't make sense to other people. They think you're paying for the land. But because the land essentially is considered to be free, you don't get to actually choose which plot you want so if you particularly don't go to a Cebu and have a look, then the next plot available will just be allocated to you. If, for example, you did go to a Cebu and have a look, then you could perhaps have a word with Florence and say, because what she'll do is she'll show you that what's available in terms of the bulk. So not just the next plot, but she can show you the next few plots which are available. So she'll show you the next few plots are available and from that you can choose. Or if you really feel that where it's available, you don't want that particular area, then you'll have to speak with them at the office. Because otherwise, once they once you make that payment of 1200 to the Paramount Chiefs Bank account, the next thing will be the receipt and the next thing will be the allocation paper. So if you can imagine, they're just going to allocate you know, the next plot. What we do when we get people, when people come through us, like, for example, on our trips, or if they contact me and they can be a bit patient, then I try to get, a, you know, we go and have a look and then we see which is a good location. And then I will get some kind of, not ring fence in that way, but just let her know that, you know, we've already got the 10 or so people interested. So we can just get an idea of where the land is going to be and then just give people plots, you know, choice of plots in land that we've already gone to. Okay, because we, we do have a representative there in Ghana who can come and visit the village. Yeah. And I good. guess I'm wondering is, can we schedule a tour with someone in the office um, so they can take a look at what plots are available? And is that indicated anywhere on your map that's on the website, which ones are actually still available? 
Yeah, so Florence from the map, if they go into the office, because Byron is also in the office as well. Okay. Um, so what they'll be able to do is let you know which, which are the next plots available from the map. And then you can go and take the surveyor. Byron can help you with that. And he has a fee which he charges, you know, for that. So that can be discussed with him. But what will happen is she will then show you what plots are available, which location, which area. And then mm -hmm. your person can go and see the area where the plots are available. We're mostly on to phase two at the moment. And so phase two plots are available. And there's so much plots there that the person can go and have a look at with the surveyor. Okay, great. And just to let everyone know, um, I'm interested in eventually doing this myself, but my my client, quote unquote, is, um, her name is Shante. She couldn't make it on today, but she owns a women's support service for businesses. Um, and she's very active on the internet and um, has visited Ghana several times and wants to eventually um, move there. So she would like to start with the Pan-African Village to make a purchase. Excellent. Like. That'd be excellent. I mean, I feel like sometimes I feel like the women police in Ghana, because I'm always saying, you know, where are the women representatives, you know, where are the women represented, you know, so if she's got a women's organization, I think that would be something really good because there's a lot of women on the ground doing stuff in Ghana and the more support they get, that would be great because Ghana is quite, is it patriarchal or it's male dominated, I think anyway. <laughs> yeah. So that would be, that would be great. So, Carl, yes, please. Thank you, Rachel, for the presentation. Uh, we've just got a couple of questions to ask, uh, one of which, uh, yeah, one of, well, there's three questions, one of which the, the, uh, the lady just mentioned. Do you want to mention it, Maya? Uh, I'm interested in the, the, the building process, I, I, and I was hoping Byron would talk to us about that, um, from the fencing off and then um, finding a builder, um, I don't know whether it's an architect or someone who does the drawings for the building. Um, I just wondered what the process is and how long that takes. Or, or, or take. recommended builders and yeah. recommended people who could help us. Or is that somebody? I know it's time limited. We've only got two years to actually build. Is that right? Yeah. So, you know, once you, you get your land, then we can we can help you through the process by you know um getting your land clear for you uh getting it well if you want it weed we weed it for you we get people who can come and bulldoze it for you um we have builders that can build your wall and also build you the house for you so you know, even the um, the the chief has been working hard, helping us, um, getting people top builders from municipal to come to to join us and work with us. You know, so it's a thing that we are working on right now, and by the time you will ready get your land and ready i think we should well organize to do everything for you so that you know because we've been looking at what's been happening and people been trying to confuse people you know so we don't want people start coming in and scamming any one of our people so these are the things that we've been working on. So by the time you're ready, within the next um, couple of weeks, I think we will have a team put together that can help. Okay. Okay. In in, in terms in terms of that two uh, the two years thing, is that still stipulated within the uh, the mm. having the place as well? Because I know Rachel yeah, mentioned yeah. it previously. Yeah. Yeah, that that's um uh the, the the chief will give you two years to build something on the land. But sometime if you're trying to do something and it's not happening yet, I think he will he will give you a little bit more time or uh, he could move you to a different place. 
you know. So that's how it working. What, what do you mean that I'm not sure about that? What is that? What reallocates? What reallocates? No, yeah, yeah. Yes. Reallocate so, so... to somewhere else. You okay. know, because and the the Pan African village right now we have phase one and phase two. And yeah. most of the people who have these plots on here are building and doing something. And so I'm saying, if someone not ready yet, then after two years, the chief could move them and put them somewhere else. Do you understand? I'm sorry, they couldn't, yeah, yeah. They yeah, could so I think that'll be instead three. of saying that the chief's gonna take your land back, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they're not gonna take it back. But he's a very nice man. I don't think, to be honest, I think he'll be fine. He's not going to... He understands our plight. He knows that, you know, what we're going through, and money's just not readily available all the time. So, yeah. Just, just, one, just one other question. Just one other question we want to ask. Yeah. You know, in terms of the infrastructure and, like, gas, electric, the immediacies, is that already on site? Because we brought the land. We're one of these people who's brought the land, and we, we're not going mm -hmm. there until March ourselves. So I'm just wondering, is, is everything in place there already, that amenities? There? Yeah, we have electric oh, people might have told here. Yeah? We, we have electric already. And um, we, we, we and people can put solar in. And the water, most people have their borehole. So they use the water from the borehole. I, I suppose later on, we will have the government water. Phase two doesn't have the electricity. Phase one has some electricity. Mm -hmm. So where people have recently got their land won't have electricity and it will be wash land. So I'll just go through what the process is. Byron and I sat down previously and we went through what people, what the whole process is. So basically, once you get your land, you've been allocated your plot of land, the, the king had already plotted out the land so that's what people can see that's why you can see those small red squares but then once you get your allocated plot you're going to need to get satellite navigation to locate the actual plot and so um, we can help you get the surveyor so that you will then get the satellite navigation so you know where your particular plot is before you start doing anything on there and then you will be uh, doing land clearance so you can clear the land because the land is bush is virgin land and so what people have done in order to build on there is they have to then literally bulldoze down the trees which are there and clear up the land. Now, you're going to be uh, deciding because it's your land. So if you go there and take ownership, you're then going to decide what trees, if any, you're going to try and save. But also, importantly, you have to, because there are people who may have been farming on your particular plot. So there's a small compensation scheme that is in place whereby if you, for example, are going to bulldoze down somebody's orange tree, then you need to give them compensation for that orange tree. So Byron, just so people don't get too worried, how much is the compensation, for example, for a tree? Well, it's not a lot. I think the highest would be 50 CD per tree. So 50 CDs per tree. So it depends on the trees. And that in dollars is around 4.5 dollars 50 and mm -hmm. in pounds it is american dollars in pounds is 3 pound 50 so wow. that's what the compensation you'd be paying so as you go to clear your land you'll meet with the person who has their trees there and then you'll negotiate so byron can help with that in negotiations as well you negotiate how much you're going to compensate them for the trees that they're going to lose. So there's that part, the clearance part. Then you can put your pillars around the land so that you can put your, you know, this is my land pillars. Okay, so you can put your four pillars on the plot of land. You can also, because one of the problems we have in the Pan-African village is that in terms of the roads. So people are bulldozing land, which is... How can I explain it? They're bulldozing their land and they're bulldozing the land to get to their land. And they're not necessarily demarcating the roads. So one of the things that we want to help people to be able to do is when they bulldoze and clear their actual plot, 
that they clear the road beside their plot as well as well so that's going to give them access to their plot in a proper fashion instead of at the moment how it is people are walking on what they think is the road but it's actually somebody else's land so it, you know it's creating a right of way that doesn't exist so that's kind of what we're planning to do so that you clear your land and the road alongside your land and if everybody does that in the spirit of cooperation then by you know by definition all the roads will then be in place so then you can build depending on if you want to build your concrete wall so once you've cleared it you can then build your wall around the land to demarcate and to ensure that there's no encroachment because i guess as more and more people come onto the pan-african village and we have seen little bits of it where there's a little bit of encroachment onto other people's lands we don't want to get in the same way that we normally do in the west you know but at the same time, you may want to protect your borders. So doing the wall is a way of protecting your borders. And then you'll get your poly tank. So what we encourage is people to share instead of everybody having it, because there's something called that the water, it's, you know, under, under the earth, the water's under the earth, I and mean, you can't all be pulling up the same water. So it's good if people can share from one poly tank, and then the water can go to the different houses from one poly tank. So that's going to be a shared figure and so we have got the costings which we can give you but I'm not going to give the costings today because you know people might say oh they can get it cheaper etc I'm just trying to give you the process so then you can get the poly tank and I think it's 10 people am I right Byron 10 people can have one poly tank yeah but it's a borehole Rachel oh borehole okay the borehole mm -hmm. yes yeah so you know 10 people you're right 10 people can use a borehole easy you have to just tear off from the you know run the pipes underneath and tear off to yes. each house yeah so i've got borehole is shared and that is what's going to fill the tank so yeah, yeah. The black water tank which people see above mm -hmm. the houses the water is going to come from the borehole that you're sharing and fill up yeah. the tank and the tank will go to your house is that how it's going to be it. Right. Yeah, and everyone can have a tank. Yes, yeah, so you, you have know. your own tank and share the borehole. Right. And, and then the tank, you buy the tank and you buy your own tank and share the cost of the borehole. Mm -hmm. And then you need to get your housing permit and get the inspector to come and inspect the house that you're going to be building. So sure. that is what we can help you do as well. And then you will get your architectural drawing using your site plan. And so you'll need to get a good architect who's going to come and draw the house to suit the way you want it to be done. And then they can give you certain costs as well. So you'll be paying these additional services that you'll be paying for. You'll be paying them directly. And then there are government inspection appointments as well to come and see what is happening. So although it's technically private land, Byron, am I right in saying that there will still be government officials coming yes, to inspect yeah. what's happening? Yeah. Um, it's only um, this week that they, um, the chief has written to the to the town hall to ask them if they can appoint him someone that will come and inspect the house and things like that, just to make sure everything is doing right. And the house is not going to fall down on you, you know. Exactly. So. Yeah, exactly. So um, it's not just get your bricks and put something together. There are inspections that take place as well. And then you mm. need the quantity surveyor. So Byron, can you just run us through what the quantity surveyor would do? Yeah, I think the quantity surveyor would, would work out how many bricks it would take you to build what you want to build. And how, and and how many cement, bags of cement it will take you and the wind sizes and how much that would be. You know, it's all about working out how much your house would cost you. Yeah. And so when you get to the quantity, of, quantity surveyor part, that's just before the actual building happens and you'll be able to know how much the house is going to cost. And what I would say to people at this point, which is something that I was guilty of, is that, you know, try not to build a house that is too, too big. Because I know that the land is there and really, you know, it's like, this is my dream house and I'm going to another land, et cetera. 
But I think a good idea, something that Byron actually did, is to build a smaller house that you can then extend. So Byron's house was smaller because mm -hmm. it was just him going there. But then he, he's been able to extend his house so that, you know, he has visitors there, he has family members coming to stay there. And mm -hmm. so you can do that. And that means that instead of trying to build a humongous house that you, you're probably never going to be able to afford to finish or live in, you can build a smaller house that you can then live in and whilst you're extending the house. So if you decide, oh, you know what, after all, you know, the dream, you know, I don't have to live that dream house, have the dream house now, I can just keep that smaller house. But then if you decide you still want, you know, you do want a bigger house, you can then extend it with rooms. And if it's uh, built in a particular way, you can also go upwards and build upwards as well. So that's just something I wanted to say, because I know sometimes we build a bigger house and it costs so much money to, to, to finish it off. So that's the building process. OK, and I'm just going to go back now to the questions. So, yes, thank you, Angie. Small houses all the way, because Angie lives in Ghana. She knows the struggle is real. Um, so Brian, Errol, and then Ingrid. So, Brian. Hello. Good evening. Hello there. How are you? Fine. Uh, I have a question. Uh, me and my family would like to, uh, for example, me and my sister, uh, she, has, she has their household. I have my household. But we like to buy uh, plots next to each other. Um, how how is that possible if the, the plots will not be allocated at the same time that you pay your fee? Yeah, so once you contact us, pay the money to the Paramount Chiefs account, and then you can always let us know. And Byron's in the office there, so he will know. Once you pay at the same time, the plots can be allocated next to each other. Okay. And uh, we'll, um, we'll, because we're coming to the tour in March also, uh, yeah, when we see the land, it, it will it be uh, possible to see the land and uh, let's say choose a certain area uh, so we can say, for, for example, yeah, we like to, these plots and they will be allocated at the time that we pay the fees? Yes, yeah, so no. that's the beauty of going there really, is that you can have a say on the plots, the location. What would you say to that, Byron? Because you're in the office. Yeah, yeah I would say we can choose the plot. Uh, they cannot choose the plot because um, how it works is like you get one street to give out and you just give it all out. Then when that's finished, you move to the next street. But, and that's it, you know, just that finish and, and you move on and so on. But yeah, you can't choose, you know, the actual plot because on the map even, we don't even know where the plot is. Uh, and, but we can only show you the area. If you want to see the area where where the plots are, then we could show you maybe, and then maybe it's about a few hundreds or so plots in that area. And we wouldn't know which one that you're going to get. But when every time we give it out, people are always just happy with it because it's a nice land and, you know, people love the place. So it's okay. Yeah, yeah, if you saw the small, if you saw how I had showed, I was trying to get it back up, but you know the red, you, you saw the red map and the plots are really quite close to each other. So yes, you can get the plot next to each other because you'll get it at the same time and we'll have to let the office know. But in terms of the actual location, it's one location. So although it's the next street, because it's very virgin land, unless you want to, for example, be a bit higher up on a hill, and then, you know, some, yeah, something like that, then you might decide you're going to wait, you know, you, you go there and you see it and if it's not suitable for you, it's not suitable for you. You know, that's the best way I can say it really. Because so many people are getting the land and they haven't seen it. And then if you get there, you don't like it, you know, you'll have to be talking your way around to maybe get the next piece, et cetera. So we're going there so you can see. I think all the people that came with us in March, when we found, not March, in October, we found some good land, a bit higher, and then we were all able to get close to each other. So, yeah. Did oh, you have another question? Yeah. 
Uh, not really, but uh, for me, um, I have a preference for a, a, a little higher uh, length, and so that's why I ask. Uh, and maybe my sister also wants a little higher rent, but uh, that's the reason for my question. We'll have to build our own land. We'll have to build our own hills, I think, because everybody wants it. <laughs> everybody wants it a bit higher up. <laughs> so okay. That might okay. that might be something that can be done sort of artificially on the plot. You know, okay. maybe talk to an um, architect, I guess. Um, okay. Errol, and then Ingrid. Yes, um, thank you very much, uh, Rachel. Um, excellent uh, presentation as usual. And uh, that, I must say that uh, we enjoyed our trip in October. It was awesome uh, for those of you who are planning to go. Um, so I can recommend it, uh, absolutely. Um, we, uh, in 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 addition to, to what to Brian's question about him and his sister wanting um, land close together, because we all travel together, as Rachel said earlier, um, we were able to acquire our plots close to each other. So you can do it when you're there. Um, so that's that, that maybe go a little way to answering your question. My question was, um, I'm not sure if it's for you, Rachel, or for, Bro for Byron. But first of all, Byron, thank you so much for the time that you spent with us while we were there. Um, okay. you, you, you'll have to send me- um, Send him the your, bill. Your, <laughs> send me your- <laughs> Yeah, Errol, um, good to yeah. see you. I will send you the bill yeah. soon. Yeah. <laughs> and have your, uh, and, and a, and a picture of your favorite tittle. So next time we come, we can bring you a bottle of whatever it is that um, you're partial to. Um, <laughs> okay. king. Um, the, the thing about it was, um, Byron, we wanted to find out about the land clearing. I'm, I'm sure that it's now on our minds because we've um, we've gone through the um, early stages. So what we wanted to find mm -hmm. out, and I was actually going to ask the question to Rachel, but I think it's probably been partially answered. Um, do we need to wait for the indenture to start the clearing process? Again, it's a little bit of a ticklish one because we don't want to get rid of Having seen there's some lovely trees there, we don't want to get rid of them all. Mm. Um, but we kind of need to um, we kind of need to put in uh, some um, the posts, I think. Right, the pillows. Yeah. yeah. So, so I think we're going to have to have a conversation with you, Byron, um, mm -hmm. about where to go. And and also there was a a conversation we had about the the, the, the tree the tree clearance. Right. Um, um, sorry, the counting, the counting, beg your pardon. The counting um, of the trees, it, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. it was mentioned about possibly we might have to, um, well, hopefully not yeah. to compensate, compensate anybody. Uh, yeah. But if we if we do, then we kind of need to know how many um, mature mm -hmm. trees mm -hmm. there are on the plots. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, we, we okay. will have to have a conversation about that. And yeah. it's a kind of a question as well as um, a statement. I think. What next? So it's what well, it's what next basically. What do we do now? Um because we've got the right. So um I don't have you had your allocation paper? Yes, yes, we have. Okay, so what we would have to do is check with there's the fella here that does the counting of the trees and check and negotiate with the people how much we should pay them. So I would have to talk to him and get him to get that sorted out for you. And while we're doing it, we could do everyone. So I think Rachel would have to put it all together and then we just have it all sorted out, pay the, the farmers, clear your plots and maybe start building your fence or whatever you want to do, you know? Yeah. Yeah, we, mm -hmm. we, we, we have a sort of a fence in mind, not a wall, but something mm -hmm. just to, um, to, yeah, to, to, to clear, the yeah, to make the plots identifiable. Um, oh, okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, and, and of course, if we are going to clear, we might, also, we might also have to, I don't think the road was that, um, there was a, a proper road. Uh, okay. Time but, we but, yeah, since then, I've uh, had this lady cut a road up to hers, and I think it was next door to where the guy, the surveyor, had 
has showed us that your plot's going to be. Okay, okay. So there's a road almost up there. And then from there now, you would just uh, pay uh, the, the bulldozer a small amount of money just to cut the road to your place. So okay. that you can get your material. Yeah, so let me just run through it quickly then. So it was the five, it was the seven steps. It was getting the land, going to see the land, making payment for the land, getting your receipt for the land, and paying it into the Paramount Chief's account, getting pay, getting your receipt for the land, then you get your allocation paper. And at the point of getting the allocation paper, you can start acting like it's actually your land. Whilst you're doing that, you're waiting for the office to arrange your indentures and give you your indentures and get your site plan with that as well. So once you're starting to make preparation on your land, the first thing you'll do is get a, a, the surveyor to do a satellite navigation to locate your land. So the actual plot itself because what you would have seen is the area, but you're going to see the actual plot itself and be able to put your four pillars around your plot so you can, with your name on it, so you'll know exactly where it is. And that's when we can then get the person to come and count the number of trees on the land. And then you have the negotiations about how much compensation you're going to pay them for the trees. And then what's saved is saved. What's not saved is going to be bulldozed down and slashed so that you get a clear place to build. And also we recommend a clearing or bulldozing the land at the side of your plot as well, so that we can create that road as well. Once that is done, you can either decide whether you're going to just leave your four pillars to demarcate your land, or whether you're going to just get a fence so that you can keep your boundary secure, or whether you're actually going to build a wall. Then you can get the borehole done, which is can be a shared borehole. So those people who've bought together in a, a, a group may decide to put a, a borehole together to buy a borehole and put it together and people who come again with us and acquire land as a group can make that same decision as well so that you can share the borehole or also if you haven't got land through us you know then you can also speak to Byron or speak to myself and we can see who's nearby you so that you can also share a borehole and share the cost of the of the borehole as well it's normally around 10 people and then you need to get your own poly tank and then you get your architect to you, you do the application for your housing permit with the inspector you get your architect to do the architectural drawing so you start forming what your house is going to look like i guess you could do that anytime you wanted to but you need the uh, site plan for that as well then you get your uh, builders in who can read the plan. You need to arrange, which Byron can arrange for the government inspectors to come out and just inspect that what you're doing is going to be allowed. And then you're going to get your quantity surveyor who can tell you exactly how much the cost of your house is going to be. And then the building will start taking place. And so the services that we offer will be the project management services and Byron will offer the building management services because I'm not going to go too far into the building of it all <laughs> because I know my limits. <laughs> so whereas we can help, I can help like with the management of it all, the actual building of itself is going to be, uh, Byron will take over that with the, with the builders and et cetera, et cetera. So that's basically the process, but we can take you through that process step by step, because I think what has happened in the past is that people saw on YouTube, et cetera, got their land, and then there's so much land there that people are not actually developing. So one of the things which is important for us is when we have these meetings, the goal is that so people can develop their land and build their property if they want to do so. Yeah, Errol, is that any more questions? No, no that's okay. it. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. Thank you. Um, so one of the challenges that Shantae and I have run into in looking for land, because we have made a few attempts, is um, the registration process and confirming that the people who are actually selling the land actually own the land. Do, do we have to worry about that with the village? Is there any registration process that is required 
Yeah, but there is, um, we know that there's a, a lot of issues with, with people here selling land that's not theirs. But this, this land, we shouldn't have any problem with it because it's between the government and the king has decided that they're going to give us this land. And, and as we know, nobody's higher than them, so nobody will be able to take it away from us and saying it's their land, you know. So that Great. is it. So in the, in the lands, com is it the lands commission's office? Mm -hmm. A Cebu Pan-African village would be registered as being owned by the chief? Yeah, it would register as a group. Register in, to us as a group, and okay. that's when. So when we get um, like a plot of land from them, then they will register it. In they give us an intention in our name to say that we have. It's like a deed, right? Yeah, but so but 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 they also work in that we can register it individually in our name. That's what I was wondering. Okay. Yeah, that, that's coming up soon. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you. And how many yeah. acres are there total? How many acres and how many phases are planned for the future? Right. Well, they're planning 5,000 acres. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And... Um, you know, so I don't know how, what so else. Phases coming. Like, uh, sorry? Several phases coming in the future, I would assume. I don't know. They might just leave it as it is now and just call everything phase two. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it is a massive space. Okay. Yeah. Good now. Very yeah. large. What I was going to add as well, I think I need to add it actually, is there's phase one and phase two. Uh, phase one, I think, is around 100 acres. And then phase mm -hmm. two is larger, just looks like it's continuous. <laughs> it's ongoing, yeah, as Byron that's, said. That's they can just probably call the whole rest of it phase two now. But on phase one, as you're asking about land issues, there was a dispute, or, or there is an ongoing dispute on phase one where there's a family that says the land on phase, some of the land, some of it on phase one is theirs. Mm -hmm. And so that is something that the Paramount Chief is dealing with. But where the land now is available is on phase two. And okay. so there are no such issues on phase two. So the land would be, when I saw the king the time before last, he did say that the land is now registered in the name of the Paramountcy, the whole of the land, because previously... It was just land. And normally, if you give land in Africa, you just give land and people build on it. But we want to register our little portion in our own name. So yeah. that means the paramount, you have to register the land as a block. And then that will enable everybody to go ahead and register their plots as well. So that's what people are able to do. So, so you all, some of you all have already been able to actually register the land in your name. I'm not sure if anybody's done that so far because I know that the registration of the paramountcy has only just taken place. Okay. So, so that's down the pike. And I know Byron's there. not a big, Byron just live off the land. So I know <laughs> Byron's not into <laughs> all this registration, this, that, and the other. He's perfectly happy. The king gave him the land and he lives on the land and he's built his house and nobody's bothering him. So I know he doesn't look for all this kind of technocratic yeah okay unless unless byron you do know somebody who's registered at the moment no no i don't think there is anyone who and and this pan-african village that register yet okay because i think the the king was just getting all everything sorted out mm -hmm. and then he he did say to me within a few weeks you know they'll be able to, to register how many owners so far Right. And the Pan African. So, sorry, just to, just to interrupt. So there's 10 minutes left, um, which we're going to finish around half past. And there's a few people with their hands up. If I don't see you, if you, you can put your hands up or you can interrupt if you haven't had a chance to ask your question. So, Tammy, in terms of how many owners, the king did say recently that they've given 
away 400 plants, which I imagine is probably a bit more than that now because that was oh, yeah. time earlier this year. Maybe about a thousand. So there'd be a thousand plots which have been given away because it's just going so quickly. Sometimes when you say owners, not, it's not the case that every one person has one plot. Some people have more. They could have it in a family or that kind of thing as well. Yes. So, but that's how much plots have been given. Did somebody else what, have a question? It's telling me two people. Does anybody else have a question that hasn't asked a question yet that wants to ask a question? Just unmute. Yeah, I thought I have another question, uh, Rachel. Yeah, I did yeah. deliberately say who hasn't asked a question, but go on then. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I went no, no I'm, I'm just feeling happy on Sunday. No, go ahead and ask a question. Go on. Thank you. Uh, in the beginning, you said uh, that uh, you get a plot allocated, but if you don't build within the two years, uh, the king might relocate you. But after you put up a fence, is it still possible that the king might say, oh, no, you have to relocate or... Once your fence, your fence is put with uh, uh, around your plot, the plot is uh, yours. I guess the first thing I'd probably say before even answering is that I think people would need to, because yes, it's good to have the land and to be able to keep the land there that you've got land in Africa. But it's also, you know, you're paying a fee for the land. And also people do have to be realistic in terms of what they can afford to do within a given time. So if the two years has passed and then three years and four years and five years, I think it might be a waste anyway to even get the land there. This land is not for commercial purposes to resell and get it on a profit. So I would encourage not necessarily yourself, I'm just answering the question generally, encourage people to be realistic. And if you're not going to be able to build, then there may not be a purpose in even buying or acquiring the land, pay, paying the fees, what I'm saying for the land. But in terms of how the king operates, there have been people, because this project started in 2019 and really got underway in 2020, and there have been people who've had land since that time. And as far as I'm aware, he hasn't reallocated their land to others. I don't think it's something he wants to go on indefinitely, but he hasn't reallocated. And certainly if you've built your wall and made um, you know, certain steps to show an interest in the land, I don't think he's going to reallocate it. He's not that kind of, he seems like a very nice person. He's not that kind of person from what I know of him so far. Byron, did you want to add anything? No, that's true. Uh, you know, like I said before, he he won't take away your land. But if you if you can't build in two years and you build a fence on it, um then he might still relocate you unless you're going to start building you know you got some architectural drawing and you're ready to start building then you know that that's okay if that's within two years but if you haven't done nothing and the place keep growing up in bush and other people around you are building then it's not really fair to the other people because you know, they have all the bush around them and they have a nice house, you know. So, yeah, that yeah, kind so that's of probably, thing. That's probably a word to the wise, really, that if you're not going to be able to do anything in two years, like plan out your budget. And if you're not going to be able to start any building in two years, then probably it's best to leave it and then just think about when you'll be able to do so. Because, as I say, I don't think I don't think the king will, will take it back. I mean, being reallocated is not such a big issue, I guess, because it's just in the same area. But if you really feel strongly that you don't want to be reallocated, for example, then it's probably best, if you know you're not going to do anything in two years, to not start. I'm going to ask Morris and then Ingrid. I'm going to read her question because I've seen her question. I'm going to ask Morris and then we can wrap it up, I think, unless someone's got something very pressing. So, Morris, if you go ahead. How are you? Um, hello, Rachel. Thank you very much. Um, you know, for arranging another another Zoom meeting, and and I'm listening to all the conversations going. And thanks, Byron, and thank you, Rachel and Byron, for allocating my family and I a plot. And we are looking forward to coming in March, Rachel. So That's we'll good. be on the trip. And oh, my. My question is not a question really, but it is a just to thank you for the work that you're doing and we've been following the progress 
including uh, looking at uh, the YouTube clips that you are putting up. Very informative, and uh, number of people are already building, which is impressive. And uh, Byron, uh, the work that you do there is amazing. And Rachel also Thank coordinating. You. That's great. And uh, we are just impressed. And I can see my wife has been on the call as well. So she's listening in the background. And uh, thank you very much. I, I, haven't, I haven't got much to say, but uh, just to thank you. Thank you okay. very much. Much appreciated. So Morris is from the African Tourism Showcase. And they're quite instrumental in what we also do, which is helping people to rediscover the African continent as well. So it's really nice to have him here. And as he says, to have him as a neighbor on the Pan-African village as well, even though he's not, unless I'm mistaken, but he's not Ugandan, he's not Ugandan, not Ghanaian. Yes. So that's just to show you the diversity of people who are coming. Right. So Ingrid's question is, the first question was what happens at the end of the lease? I can't see anymore. But the first question is, what? Oh, thank you, Ingrid. Yes, yeah, she agrees. Thank you. She's thanking us, Byron. Um, where can we have an idea of the price range for a two or three bedroom? Okay, I'll come to that. What happens at the end of the lease? So we had a meeting with the Lands Commission, and he was very informative, and I took notes. So I'm just going to refer to them because it's an important question that everybody wants to know. So at the end of the lease, the person who has the lease in their name has to have first refusal on getting the lease renewed. So it won't just be you if you're not here in 50 years time, it will be if you've passed it on to a family member. So the lease can be renewed in the name of the person who already has it. And that is under, if you like, Ghanaian law, customary law. And then also, which is something that I picked up then from that meeting, was they have a customary land secretariat. And so most recently, the Ghanaian government has said that all paramountcies should have a customary land secretariat to ensure that when leases are uh, finished, that they can be renewed with ease and so that everybody is clear that the person whose name the lease is in has first refusal on getting the lease renewed and that it shouldn't be on an exorbitant amount. It shouldn't be for an exorbitant amount of money either. So what happens when the lease finishes is it is renewed under in accordance with Ghanaian law. And anybody who wants to get more information about that because they feel that's going to be a sort of um, deciding factor, particularly if you're going to build your house on there, you would need to speak to a lawyer of your choosing who specializes in Ghanaian law, that would be the best thing to do. We are going to have a meeting with the Lands Commission coming into it probably in uh, February time, or if not end of January. And he's also a lawyer. He's excellent. He's had a great presentation and he'll be able to answer all those questions as well. But the bottom line is the lease can be renewed. And then how can you get details of basically the cost of building so you can send an email at info at asebupav.com, which will go to me, and then we can arrange a consultation with Byron as well, so that we can guide you on the process for people who are ready to go on to the next stage um, and really clear their land and get themselves building. We arrange a consultation and then put the ball and get the ball rolling. Okay, so I see Roy and Vanessa have a question. And I think once we've answered that question, we will close. So, hello there. Hello. Uh, this is really not going to be a question. Actually, I'm going to promote you. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, Vanessa and I, were on that uh, tour back in October, and we just want to encourage anybody that's uh, considering uh, going on the tour with Rachel to uh, act on that and uh, you won't be disappointed. Mm -hmm. We did so many things uh, within the, I guess, how many days? Uh, about 13 days that we were there and uh, Rachel was the perfect point guard. <laughs> she she made sure everything went well. Uh, we The accommodations we had were nice. Uh, the places we went to eat and to, be entertained was great. Uh, of course, the castle was the castle. And, and I tell you, 
uh, Rachel handled everything well. So if you're considering uh, going on, on her tour, uh, you won't be disappointed. And we actually ended up creating a family, a new family, uh, Errol and Gabe, and I see Marcy up there. Um, we, we, we made lifelong friends and it was a very special thing. So if, if you're thinking about it, act on it. That's all I have to say. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. And you were all the greatest guests as well. It was really, it was really wonderful, really wonderful time. And there's so many uh, spontaneous moments that happened um, that I'm going to be sharing a few of them um, as we go along. Um, there was, you know, we did libation in the, in the, in the dungeon, just out of the blue, you know, Lynn did libation and Errol. And I found that to be amazing. Um, and I recorded it actually, because I just, was one of those, I think I better get my camera out moment. And then Roy did a wonderful sort of uh, little speech as well to just recognize mm -hmm. the power um, of being in that place at that time and the mission that we were on to pay homage to our ancestors. So we give thanks really for that. And we give thanks that the trip for March is full. And uh, we're going to plan other trips. We're going to have one in October, which is going to be around the same time. And then we're going to have one early November because as well, people want to go to see the festival, the Asebu Festival. So in October, it's going to coincide with us going across to Togo for a few days as well. And so if you want to go to Ghana, and do a few other things and then to Togo because we're going to have a tour to Togo where we're going to look at investment in Togo and we're going to look at aqui, aqua, like fish investment, fish farming and all that sort of thing in Togo as well. So we're going to have those tours. And the other thing I wanted to say, which Byron and I were talking about and we want to, we're going to, we're going to probably bring it into another meeting because we're going to bring this one to, to an end is we want to do partnerships with the people in Asebu. So Asebu is a town where the people are living and we are coming into their area as a diaspora and our Pan-African village is on the end of the town. But what we're looking to do now into the new year, and we've talked about this to, uh, Byron has mentioned this to the Paramount Chief and he's given us his go ahead, is the people on the ground in Asebu who already have their shops and businesses and they haven't really got the money to develop we're going to be looking at partnering with those people so that we can help them develop the businesses in the high street. There's clothes shop, there's food shops, there's bric-a-brac shops, you know, just helping them to develop their businesses in a profit share basis. And then that's going to be the first port of call for us in terms of promoting the traditional area is to look at the business needs of the people on the ground in Asebu and start with them. And so the meeting that we're going to have, particularly in the new year, is going to be focusing on the commercial aspect of business in Asebu. And also, if people have business ideas of the, their own, some people have very big business ideas, and that's great, but those business ideas are not going to probably work in Asebu. It may be that it's in Cape Coast or in Accra. Sabu really is very much for a smaller type business in terms of the population that's there and in terms of probably the disposable income of the people who frequent that area. So you'll be looking at Cape Coast and Accra. But again, we can have some consultations because there are people in Accra that I'm linking up with as well so that they can give us the information that we need and they've got the certain contacts that we'll need to be able to push what we're doing forward. So one thing I'm good at is getting contacts and networking. So I'm using those skills to really network and get the right people involved in this initiative. So there's a lot more to come next year in terms of what we're doing. I saw a question which said, do you have to visit the land before getting it? Although I've said so many times, you know, try to visit the land first, but nobody ever does that. So no, you don't have to visit the land before getting the plot. You can get the plot of land before you actually go there. But, you know, you've heard it here first you may not be allocated what you thought you would be or what you would have wanted to be allocated. So just bear that in mind. And to be fair, if you can't go to see the plot or you haven't got any near plans to go to Ghana, then, you know, you have to wonder why you would just get a plot and then not go and visit it, not go and visit the land as well. So at least if you get in the plot, do try and have, uh, you know, a visit to Ghana in the near future so you can know what's going on. So... I'd like to thank everybody. I think we've answered all the questions. 
our contact is info at asebupav.com, which I think has been put in the link. I think we've given quite a bit of information today. Tammy is saying shebosstalk.com to learn more about the services. Yes, and help support to save a PAV business groups. Excellent. That's exactly what we want. So shebosstalk.com. We absolutely need powerful women in Africa and Ghana. I think there's a, a big gap there in terms of the society being quite matriarch, uh, patriarchal, I should say. Um, and I did say when I went to Cape Coast, I gave them a job to do. I said, the next time I come, I want to see more female presence. <laughs> I told them, I told the, um, the, oh, the, um, the organisers of Cape Coast that Cape Coast Castle. So thank you everybody so much. Unless anyone's got any last minute questions that they absolutely need to ask us, if you do unmute. Great. Byron, I'd like to thank you so much. Angie, who was on the call as well, she also helped to make the trip wonderful. She was there with me the whole time. And she is doing that as well as just being a wonderful person, but on, on behalf of Jamaica Affairs mm -hmm. Ghana. So Jamaica Affairs Ghana also are there on the ground to help people as well. And when we go on in March, we'll be meeting up with them as well. So I would really like to thank you all. Have a wonderful Christmas. We celebrate it. Have a great Kwanzaa. Happy New Year. And we will see you probably now on the other side of the Christmas period. Thank you, Roy and Errol, for your vote of support there as well. Yeah. And... Marcia is there and Gabe is there as well. So thank you all so much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Everybody, bye-bye. Bye-bye.